We made it, everybody. It is game week. It is the War Chant Report. It is still powered by Cummins. This time, though, just go follow them on Instagram. Cummins Lifestyle. It's all one word. They're dropping their new generator, the Onan QG4000i. They're going all across the country. They're going to be in Chicago, or actually, rather, South Bend, Indiana. Jeff Cameron's going to be partying in Chicago for the Notre Dame game. I'm getting a little bit envious of that. We're going to be in Dublin before all that. But again, support our folks over at Cummins. Some Florida State fans listening to a War Chant podcast one day are like, hey, can we help you guys out? We certainly appreciate them. We appreciate you being here. Hit the thumbs up. Subscribe to WarChant.com. $1 for two months of access. FSU1 is the promo code. He's Corey Clark, Jeff Cameron. I think I'm pointing maybe right guys, wrong guys. You know who they are. They got the glasses, which usually is Corey, but Jeff's got his on as well. Rep in Dublin, our guy Jeff Cameron, wildly popular radio host, Corey Clark, senior writer for WarChant.com. Florida State taking on Georgia Tech. Season opener for everybody. Week zero, everybody. The Air Lingus College Football Classic, which you should download the app if you're going to be in Dublin. And be sure that you come out on Friday night and hang out with the two guys above me and myself and Gene Williams and Irish Ophel and Tom Lang at the old storehouse in the Temple Bar District of Dublin from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock Irish time. Are you going to be doing a live show, apparently, Jeff Cameron, you wild I'm man? Doing a live, so I'm doing a live show that night, and then I'm doing a show Tuesday and Wednesday, same time, 6 to 8 p.m. Irish time. And then on Thursday, we're doing a live Jeff Cameron show from Leopardstown Racetrack. Hmm. Man, Some things are getting done. Holy moly, making the most of your trip out there. <laughs> yeah. So you know, the math right is it so you're still one to three o'clock eastern time back here in the states, right? Still on that your is, time slot. That is correct, buddy. That's correct. All right. We'll be watching the game against Georgia Tech at 5 p.m. local time. It'll be high noon back here in America on the East Coast, ESPN. 11 and a half the line now between Florida State and Georgia Tech. We'll see if that impacts our picks. Uh, at the end of this segment that we do here on the War Chant Report. But I want to start things off with you, Jeff. Just obviously we know what this team was last year, how special they were, how much talent they brought together, and how quickly they try to replenish that in the transfer portal. And they did it, it seemed like, going into spring. You felt pretty good about where they were. There was no big fish out there in May like a Keon Coleman. So how much, if anything, has changed in your mind about where this team was coming out of spring and now where they're at after the preseason being over, has anything changed in your mind for expectations or where this team could possibly go? I think it would be uh, a bit of a uh, broken record here where I, I have a little bit more concern about wide receiver and how good that group can be. Really, I would say, in fairness, that kind of began the day that we saw um, Destin Hill go down. And that, and that, to me, really kind of changed the projections of this receiving room. I don't, I don't know that they're going to be great. They might be, but I don't know. And I think with him, a lot of questions were answered. So now some guys have to step up. Uh, I do think this is a team that's going to run the football, but I have some concerns about wide receiver. Other than that, I feel pretty good about where they're at. What about you, Corey? Where, do you feel as bullish, more bullish, less bullish? Uh, than you did about Florida State's prospects for 2024 after seeing the amount of preseason practices you were able to uh, log in this preseason? Yeah, I think I feel uh, a little more bullish. Um, I, I like Cam Riley at linebacker. Uh, I, again, he's not a revelation. I'm not going to say he's a revelation. He's not the next Marvin Jones. Well, heck, the next Marvin Jones is already on the team, like literally. <laughs> um, uh, but it, he's he. I think he's going to play. I think that is a solid addition to a group that needed it. Um, he's athletic, he's big, he's rangy. I think he's going to play a lot. That was a really, we talk about late additions. It's not Keon Coleman level, uh, but it's going to be a big addition for that defense. And then when it comes to the offense, yeah, you just, you watch this offensive line over the course of three weeks. And, and I would just be very, very surprised if it's not, uh, good. I'm not going to say it's going to be dominant, not going to say it's an all timer, but last year at best, we would say it was average, right? when you incorporate running game and passing game, pass protection, it was average. It was just an average offensive line. We thought it was going to be better than it ended up being. They still went 13 and 0. this year. I think it's going to take a step. And if it takes a step from average to good, well, then I think this offense, the ceiling gets raised, even if they don't have elect electricity at every spot wide receiver wise, I think that offensive line is going to make a big difference. Let me keep it with you then Corey here uh, talking about this, number two wide receiver that has not emerged is are we making a mountain out of a molehill are, are things so good in Tallahassee right now that we're nitpicking on something as maybe trivial some people might think is having a number two wide receiver or how would this pose a problem for a football team that's chasing the ultimate prize and that's a national championship 
I don't even think it's necessarily like, do they have a number two or a number three? I think there were times in the preseason where like, do they have anybody that would have played last year a, a, a considerable amount? Do they have anybody that's any good? And I don't mean like they're all terrible. I mean, do they have any good receivers, not average college football receivers, but good receivers? I do think Malik Benson is a good receiver. I think that has been established from what I've seen. I think he is he's poised to have a big year. After that, there are question marks. They have some solid dudes. They have experience. Uh, well, I, they have old guys, not with a ton of experience. Portier and Williamson haven't played a lot, but um, their experience. There hasn't been anybody that, in my mind, has kind of stepped up and proven they're going to be good. Again, just because they're good isn't saying I'm th they're bad. There are plenty of people that are pretty good or average at a lot of things. Jeff's a Jeff, you're a good radio show host. Oh, whoa. <laughs> There's a lot of, you know, there, you're not just a radio show host. I guess the way in football parlance, um, it seemed like for a stretch of preseason, it looked like there were just a lot of guys. They were just guys. Some of them have had good moments here lately where you think, okay, maybe the lights turned on. Maybe they are going to contribute and produce. That was my biggest concern. Malik Benson, though, is a guy, is more than a guy. He's a dude. And Ja'Kai Douglas, you know, is going to make plays for you. Jeff, you're an artist, but, you know, instead of paint brushes, you have your words. Can can you paint a picture for someone like me that I think I kind of lean maybe a little bit closer in your direction when it comes to, you know, hand-wringing, if you will, over not having a number two uh, wide out that's proven, that's produced. Paint a picture of how this affects Florida State's chances. Is it a game in Dallas? Is it a shootout maybe that gets out of control and you don't have enough bullets in your gun? Is it is it a Miami game or a Clemson game where a guy like Malik Benson gets neutralized? How does not having that number two reliable guy that we all kind of we trust on the outside, how does that affect how a season can play out? I think you play four teams that could gear up to stop the run. And at which point you're going to get out of what you want to do. They want to run the ball. I think this is a very good offensive line. I'm not sure about this receiving core at all. I'd like to believe that some guys will emerge. And I do think Blake Benson could be a good player. He's never had to do it before, but we'll see if he does in, in this situation. But to do any of that that we're talking about with the receivers, they got to be able to run the ball. That's going to be their identity. And then from there, things open up and you get opportunities to make plays because you get a lot of one on ones once you establish the run. You're going to face a Clemson team that can stop the run. You'll face a Miami team on the road that probably will gear up to stop the run. And those teams will dare you to beat them throwing the football. I don't know that Florida State is armed for a fight where they have to throw the ball uh, as much as some of those teams are going to make them to in order to have success or be efficient on offense. So the, the, the nightmare scenario is that you end up playing a team like a Clemson or like a Notre Dame on the road or like a Miami on the road who have some guys up front that can neutralize your run game. And then they say, all right, DJ, all right, receivers, make some plays. We don't think you can. That could be a problem. I mean, I'm going to be very interested to see if they can line up and get that done. We don't know. I'm not saying they won't do it, but that would be my concern. And that would be the scenario by which you end up with three or four losses. All right, well, that's certainly a problem, but I think something that we're all resting our hat on that's going to be a problem for everybody else is, is this Florida State defense, Corey. Uh, you know, I don't know how you want to, def to define elite. Is it just guys that are going to wreak havoc in the trenches, create tackles for loss, uh, absolutely wreck possessions for the opponent, like an opportunistic secondary that's going to create turnovers? Uh, plainly said, like, will this Florida State defense be considered elite this upcoming season, do you think? Uh, yeah, probably, <laughs> maybe. Um, I, I, I view elite as what we saw at the end of last year. Now, that's a very, very high bar, but that was an elite defense. That's one of the better defensive efforts um, for a final two game stretch that I've that I've seen since I've been covering Florida State. Um, so if, if that's the definition of elite, well, then no, I don't expect that. But the rest of 2023 portions of 2022 it can certainly be as good or better than that because i i really do like the depth up front man i i just do i i know they lost who they lost but um you know those two defensive ends three really when you count lola Hea, are going to be factors and then you have it, you know if they can stay healthy and stay on the field you have jackson and farmer who's one of the better i think interior combinations in the country that's a bear to prepare for. Like we talk about all the time, like if you don't have a good offensive line, it's hard to do anything. Well, this defensive line can neutral if it's playing well, 
can neutralize almost anything an offense wants to do, Jeff. Like, if you can't block up front, yeah. it kind of screws up everything. And those front four, which is really going to be a rotation of like eight to ten guys, I think, should kind of screw up everything. That's why I think they can be very, very good. Elite, I don't know. That's semantics. But they can be very good again. All right, we can we can we can work we can work and live with very good. I mean, we're not talking spike baseballs in the year 2024, Jeff. But when you think about this defense, where is uh, the ceiling? What sort of superlatives, adjectives do you think you'll be using to describe this defense as the season goes on? You hope the top 20 defense. I, I think by most measures, you will end up at the end of the year as a top 20 defense. I think they'll be that kind of dominant. I, I like that front that Cordy just described. I actually came to like some of the guys that are rotating in after that first four. Uh, I was a little worried about that going into camp originally, but I feel pretty good about what I've seen there. So I think they have enough guys uh, to be able to rest those uh, studs up front, the, the first team guys, uh, and, and not fall off in terms of production, not just get gashed when those dudes are not in the game. Game. And the secondary, I think, has a chance to be one of the best. It'll be, I think, the best in the ACC and one of the best in the country. I really believe your two starting corners are as good a duo as you're going to see in college football this year. I think they're going to be that kind of special. Uh, I think you've got a player in Shaheem who's poised to have a big, big year with all the football he's played uh, at the safety position. They need Devontae Brown or somebody else at the other safety position to step up. But they've got a lot of options there. We've all watched these practices. They run really deep. To Corey's point, he's talked a lot about when the offense is going up against a scout team defense. Sometimes you're looking at third and fourth on the depth chart from this defense in that secondary, and they're all guys that you can't wait to see start someday. So I really think that this defense is going to carry the day for Florida State. It's going to be a different kind of season, and I think they'll lean heavily on the fact that they have an elite punter, an elite kicker, and a very, very, very good defense so they can be patient in the run game on offense. Not even sure why Georgia Tech's going to get on a plane and do this, but they're going to do this. <laughs> Right, uh, sure. Let's take a look at the opponent, the Georgia Tech Ramblin' Wreck, the Yellow Jackets, some may say, right after this on the War Chant Report, powered by Cummins. Your favorite football team doesn't stop pushing its limits on the climb to the top, and neither does a global power technology leader like Cummins. Cummins has released its new QG4000i generator and is taking it across the country to show America that whether it's turbo diesel engines or taking it easy in your RV, life is a little bit better with a touch of the Cummins lifestyle. The Own and Unplugged Tour is crisscrossing the country, including a stop in South Bend, Indiana, home of Notre Dame, when the Fighting Irish hosts Florida State on November 9th. FSU will play like a champion. You come by and tailgate like one. Follow Cummins Lifestyle on Instagram for updates, and don't forget to get involved every week in generating discussion on Wake Up War Chant for your opportunity to win free Cummins swag and a chance at a portable generator or power station. Cummins Lifestyle on Instagram. Give it a follow. Welcome back into the War Chant Report powered by Cummins. Give them a follow over on Instagram, Cummins Lifestyle. It's all one word. Just hit the follow button. Get all the updates as they do their own and unplugged tour going all across the country culminating in that awesome night in South Bend, Indiana, before the Florida State Notre Dame game on November 9th. And don't forget, if you're going to be in Dublin, uh, download that Aer Lingus uh, College Football Classic app, gets you all the information on all the events going on, or just put this one in your mind. Friday night, we'll be hanging out, meet and greet the entire War Chant staff, the old storehouse in the Temple Bar. I think it's a district. I think we call it, it the is. Temple Bar District. Uh, big venue. I think over like 1,500 people can fit, but when you think about the amount of Florida State fans that are going to be there, you might want to get early. It might be a little bit of a tight squeeze. Six to nine o'clock local time there in Ireland. Jeff's going to be doing a live show that's going to uh, fall between the parameters, obviously, of the uh, one to three o'clock live broadcast of the JCS here on the East Coast of America. All right, with that said, we've talked about Florida State plenty on the JCS on Wake Up War Chant over on warchant.com. You should subscribe. FSU one's a promo code. We got our Matt Lacerre, though. Go behind enemy lines. Get a full look at the Georgia Tech program with Chad Bishop from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. All right, everyone. I am Matt Lacerre, staff writer here at Warchant.com, here with Chad Bishop of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, let's start getting into this Georgia Tech team. You guys got a lot of expectations. Ended the season well last year. Uh, starting after that Miami win, it kind of went all up from there. Uh Haynes, let's start off with Haynes King, the quarterback. He's kind of got some lofty expectations going into this season. What do you expect to see from him? Um, he, he has approached that head on. I mean, he's talked about those expectations. Uh, I think he went into the offseason knowing that not only are the expectations higher statistically, but they are from a mental and emotional and leadership standpoint. Uh, and he took that head on. You know, he joked that he 
uh, did an internship under Chris Winkie, Georgia Tech's quarterback, to go to the offseason to really prepare himself, not only for this season, but, you know, to put himself in position to be drafted in the NFL draft. He hasn't said that publicly, but I think we all know that's sort of where he wants to go with his college football career. Um, so he, the expectations are high, uh, and he could be better. I mean, he had a lot of interceptions last year. His completion percentage wasn't top of the line. Um, So there's a lot of things he can do better. If he does that, he will have a special season for Georgia Tech. Let's look at the wide receiver core. Last year, you guys had a true freshman kind of emerge. Track athlete looks really fast from I'm looking. Talk about him, uh, Eric Singleton, and then the other wide receivers we should watch for. It's more of a smaller group, but they're very quick and they're very fast. Uh, Eric Singleton is the guy that can stretch the field probably the best with his track speed. Uh, Joined the track team in the spring and uh, put up some really good numbers in the 100 meter and the 200 meter. He's going into his sophomore season, but you got some veterans like Malik Rutherford, who's very fast, uh, Christian Leary and Chase Lane, two guys who transferred in from the SEC a couple years ago. Um, you got a guy, Abdul, J- J- Abdul Janay, who transferred in a couple years ago from Duquesne, of all places. Uh, so there's a lot of veteran guys who, who've been on this roster for a couple years, who know the offense, uh, who are not going to clamor over who has you know the most catches or the most yards. And Buster Faulkner, offensive coordinator, likes to spread the ball around a lot. So the wide receiving core, you know, I don't know if they have any one guy who's going to be like a first round or second round draft pick, but collectively, it's a very, very solid unit. Yeah, and then obviously Georgia Tech led the ACC in rushing last year. Brent Key, offensive line coach, I'm sure he would love to run the rock every single time, or former offensive line coach. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that running game, what it should look like this year. Do you think they're going to be as good as last year? And then also the people blocking up front for that. Well, they sort of found their identity as a team that could rush the ball at will. In the bowl game, the Gasparilla Bowl, uh, they ran the ball more than two dozen times straight to end that game. They became a dominant offensive line, and as Brent Key likes to say, they like to destroy the opponent's will to keep going. So they got four of five offensive linemen back from last year who started, plus Corey Robinson, who was a backup but played in nine games and played almost 375 snaps. Running back Jamal Haynes and his backup Trey Cooley are back. Um, so the expectation, just like it is for Haynes King and some of the wide receivers for that ground game, is to be even better. And then switching sides of the ball to the defense, We'll start with the secondary. Who is there to watch there? With the safeties, uh, LaMiles Brooks and Clayton Powell Lee, two guys who have been in the system, been in the program. They've gone through some changes, but they're sort of the anchors of the defense. So I think that's number one. If those guys can stay healthy and sort of keep that defense organized, they're going to be in good shape. Now you look at the, the, the cornerbacks and you have Warren Burrell, the transfer from Tennessee. You had a great career at Tennessee. Uh, you got Amari Harvey, who's been at Tech. Uh, but hasn't really been, you know, a true full-time starter through much of his career. Uh, you'll have a nickelback. Uh, Saeed Giggs transferred in from Rhode Island is a name to watch. Rodney Shelley is a returning player. Um, so that secondary has some pieces to be good, but they really haven't, you know, played all together in, in a full game. Yeah, and then what about the rest of the defense? Is there anyone else to watch in that linebacking core or up front? Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, you know, you got to start with Tyler Santucci, the defensive coordinator. You know, he came in in the offseason from Duke, and I know Florida State familiar fans are familiar with that Duke game last year, and he had a really good game plan against that Florida State offense. Uh, And then defensive line coach Jess Simpson also came from Duke. So there's two guys you got to start with right there, trying to change the culture and the narrative of the mindset of that defense. They brought in a lot of transfers. Uh, They have starting linebackers back, uh, Trenelius Tatum and Kyle Eford, but behind them they brought in Jackson Hamilton, and EJ Lightsley, a transfer from Georgia. And then up front, they got uh, Vandenberg from Penn State, Thomas Gore from Miami, Romello Height from USC, to sort of supplement and build depth on that defensive front. Um, so they're gonna play a lot of guys. And I think especially early in the season, they're gonna play a lot of guys to see who can step up and make plays and be counted on in that defense because it's it's gonna be new and it's gonna maybe take some time to feel out and see if they can be better than they were in 2023 because they were not a good defense in 2023. Awesome, man. And once again, that was Chad Bishop from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Thank you again, Chad, for coming on. Enjoy the game. All right, man. See ya. All right, Corey. Um, I don't know. I just get this way, kind of close to game time, the competitor that I am. I don't. I didn't fear LSU, and I don't know if I fear Georgia Tech, but I'm just like, what if – could Haynes King do something crazy? Could he be a, a second-year transfer that really – hits a crazy gear that maybe we've never seen like a Bo Nix did in his second year or Jaden Daniels or Michael Penix, uh, you know, Joe Burrow, these kind of guys. Um, tell me that's crazy. And then is it crazy to say that this is the first time Florida State's gone up against a quarterback where they, they might not have the edge at the quarterback play since, I don't know, like 2021 against Wake Forest? 
Uh, no, I, I would say going into last year's game, uh, I thought Jordan Travis was better than Jane Daniels, but not by much. And then that game notwithstanding, I think you could say Jane Daniels had a better year than Jordan Travis because Jane Daniels won the flipping Heisman. But he didn't do much against Florida State. Like they, you know, he threw a late last second touchdown when they were down by 28 points. Other than that, Florida State hemmed him up in the second half when the game got out of hand. So even if Haynes King does, some, how does win the Heisman? It doesn't mean he has to do it at Florida State's expense because the last Heisman winner uh, didn't do it at Florida State's expense. Now, look, Haynes King, um, you know, he led the he led uh, the ACC in touchdowns. He accounted for 35. He had 26 throwing and nine rushing, and he ran for over 600 yards. He is an athlete, man. He is going to run. That That's what gives you pause is um, he had a 71-yard run last year. He had a bunch of first down runs. His legs, he averaged like six and a half yards per carry, which is a lot considering college football takes sacks into accounts in rushing yards. Uh, he's a weapon with his legs, and I think that gives you more pause, to me anyway, than what he can do with his arm. I, you know, Obviously, he's not going to be thrown to the types of receivers that Jane Daniels got to throw to, um, but it, and, and he threw 15 interceptions last year, so he, he'll throw the ball into coverage. He's not, I don't think, a great uh, throwing quarterback but he can make a lot of plays. Um, so, yeah, he, he could take a jump, and if he takes a jump, I feel like his ceiling is all ACC caliber. I don't think it's going to be Joe Burrow, Jane Daniels type ceiling. I don't see that from him at all. Yeah, it does he's got all those receivers back, but he doesn't have, you know, Justin Jefferson and yeah. Jamar Chase and all the weapons that uh, the aforementioned guys had. But, Jeff, it's the preeminent position in all of team sports is the quarterback, but, but at certain programs, it means more to be that guy. Just, it feels like Florida state fans maybe haven't given the, uh, the full red carpet, uh, rose colored glasses outlook on DJ. Do, do you think Florida state enters this game with an advantage at quarterback? I know it's not quarterback versus quarterback per se, but how do you size up uh, the quarterbacks for both of these sides as we go into the game? <laughs> Well, I do think Haynes King is a very good college quarterback. I, I am concerned that if he gets rid of the interceptions that Corey was talking about, you know, Brent Key told me and he's told others in the press that he thinks that uh, Haynes King is the best quarterback in the ACC. Now, coaches are going to back their players, and I don't know that I agree with him on that, but to Corey's point, um, he can really run. If you remove the sack yardage, he had 737 rushing yards last year. That guy can really go. He, he's, he is an athlete, and he buys times and makes plays, which can really mitigate some of your prowess out there on the edges at corner. If plays are going on for five and six seconds, I don't care what kind of corner you are. It's going to be tough to cover people. So I do worry about that a, a little bit because I do think he's a talented kid if he could just get rid of the turnovers. Don't forget they ran the ball really well last year too, and uh, that's a team that – prides themselves on that, given that the head coach played offensive line there and wants to run the ball. They ran for over 1,500 yards there. So I think this is a bit of a formidable offense for Florida State's defense to deal with. You asked me a question about quarterbacks, though, so let's get back to ours and, and DJU. You know, I'm really, really interested to see what kind of season this young man has. He's done all the right things. He's said all the right things. To look at him, you see a guy who's a horse of a man who's going to be able to have success, I think, when they run him. And I do think they will run him. Different style of runner, obviously, than Jordan Travis. He's not a threat to take it to the house from 80 yards the way Jordan was. But he is a guy that can move the chains and really in short yardage situations or red zone situations. He's a guy, a tough guy to bring down. Throws the deep ball exceptionally well. I just think he's got to become much more consistent on the intermediate routes and certainly he's got to be better when he throws on the run. In his career, we've seen a lot of DJU. This is why people haven't rolled out the red carpet. We've watched him play. He's been good and bad. He's been an okay to good quarterback in his career. Really not great. He's had great moments, but he's never had a great season. He's had good seasons, and I don't think they need him to be great. They only need him to be good, but he can improve a little bit in Mike's offense, I do believe, especially because this offensive line is going to give him time to throw, and I think he will hit some of the big shots, and that'll make us fall in love with him real quick if he's throwing 60 and 70 yard bombs off a of play action uh, with some of these receivers. So DJ's an interesting guy. I think he could have his best season yet, but I do want to see it because just when you think he's on that path towards greatness, he's always found a way to come crashing down and have a bad game or two. He's got to get rid of those moments if Florida State's going to win this conference again and go to the college football playoff. You know, don't you think, Jeff, like I, he might, he's not the playmaker that Haynes King is. He just no. isn't. He doesn't produce the types of touchdowns or he doesn't have the legs, but he doesn't need to be. Right. Like he's theoretically, he's got the better team around him, so he doesn't have to be a Superman Absolutely. for this team to be win. He could be Clark Kent and this team can win. 
Yeah, don't force anything. No reason to force anything. You've got a great punter. You can flip field position with that punter. You've got a very, very good defense. I just got done saying I thought they were a top 20 defense at least. You don't have to force the issue here. Wear people down, make the safe throws, be smart with the football, and they should be fine. Corey, I, I don't know if this is accurate. I, I believe there's probably no bigger mismatch in this game than Florida State's offensive line going up against that Georgia Tech defensive line. Uh, you, you heard Matt and Chad talk about this. You know, obviously, Brent Key did a whole reset on the defensive side of the ball, brought a new defensive coordinator, Tyler Santucci. It was with Mike Elko last year at Duke. Um, but there's they're bringing a lot of the same pieces back, and the pieces they got in the portal are, aren't what you would maybe deem elite. Uh, just how pivotal of a matchup is that? Is there anything else on the field you think that favors one side more than the other as much as Florida State will have that advantage in the trenches, we think, when Georgia Tech has the ball in their hands? It's going to be interesting because – when you're 128th in the country in rush defense and you go to an offseason, your number one, two, and three goals is that can't ever happen again. We can't be a competitive football team and get steamrolled every game by everyone we play. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that does not happen again. And obviously, you can't just do it with personnel. I feel like you do it with a mindset. Like You're like, you know what? I don't care if we give up 400 yards passing a game or 500. I'm not going to get steamrolled again. We are changing the way we attack rushing offenses. So going back to the original segment, talking about Florida State's wide receivers, yes, to answer your question, I do think Florida State's offensive line is a big mismatch over that defensive line. Well, you can mitigate that as a defense if you just stack the box with the whole defense and say, beat me out wide. Beat me out wide. I am not letting you run for 250 yards because you can't stop that. Heck, you can get to a goal line. You're not running on us, man. Try something else. And I don't you think, Jeff, and Islan too, like if you can't do it with personnel, you got to do it with scheme, but you just can't be uh, uh, embarrassed every time by a run offense. So I think their whole offseason has been spent on that's not happening again. We are going to do everything we can to make that happen again. We're going to put eight, eight guys in the box, nine guys in the box. We're going to be run blitzing every down. Can this team take advantage of it? That's what I that's what I think Georgia Tech will do, and it's up to Norvell to counter that. Jeff, thoughts on that? I, I agree. I think that's going to be the game plan for the vast majority of defenses that face Florida State this year. Is they you know they've got to stop the run. They know but this one in particular, run. right? This yeah. one in particular, like oh, they well, know yeah. they can't just stand up and and play a base defense and stop Florida State. Probably right. They should. Florida State should have a lot of opportunities in the passing game that lead to one on one situations because I do think they're going to have to stack the box. I do think they're going to walk a safety up. I do think that they have to mitigate the run game. They're tired of hearing about it. I, I asked Brent Key about Key about it in Charlotte. I I brought up the fact that that many metrics they were the worst rush defense in the country. And he didn't shy away. He, he kind of chuckled and said, well, there's good news. We can't get any worse. Yep. And, you know, I mean, he had fun with it, but you could tell he was very serious about fixing that so much so that he fired somebody and brought somebody new in. And they brought in the Romello Height kid, the edge rusher from USC, who was originally at Auburn. Um, I don't know that he changes who they are as a defense, but certainly it's a, it's a, a tick up in personnel uh, on the edge there trying to set the edge. So I, I, I find it fascinating. I do think Georgia Tech will sell out early in in this game to try to stop the run and see if Florida State gets flustered because Mike wants to run it. They're built to run it. They got a stable of running backs that suggest they should be able to run it. They've got offensive linemen that have been playing ball here since, you know, 22, 2021, 2020, 2019. Jesus, I, they, they ought to be able to run it. And if you can, does Florida State begin to wring their hands and get a little nervous and kind of get out of character? It'll be fascinating to see. But if I were Georgia Tech, that's exactly what I would do. Uh, Tech also added Thomas Gore, who played at Miami last year, but only 167 reps on the interior of the defensive line. Uh, Jordan Vandenberg, who was at Penn State, played 154 snaps last year. He's a fourth-year guy, too. So um, they're throwing things at the problem. Not sure if they've solved it, though. Yeah. Uh, but as we inch ever closer to making our game predictions, one thing from each of you, if you could, please, though, keys to victory, or rather key to victory, singular, Corey. Uh, when you look at this, give us the, the one thing Flores State can do that just – Makes us sleep good at night here these next few nights uh, if it all goes according to plan for the Knowles on Saturday in Dublin. I'm going to not stop the running game is too pedestrian. It's too general. Stop the running back running game. Like if you if Haynes King is the only one that can get outside and make plays with his legs. I mean, you can't stop everything, man. And he's a good runner. But if he only has to run th four or five times because the rest of the running backs are, are finding big holes, that's a big problem. That's a big problem. So I I think that if you can stop the traditional running game, which Florida State obviously did a very good job 
almost all season last year in doing that. If you can stop the traditional running game, you're going to win the game, I think. If you put them in third and long situations where he puts all the pressure of the world on him, we just talked about the turnovers, you will get some key takeaways and, and, and maybe win the game rather comfortably if you can stop the traditional running game. Yeah. Jamal Haynes, real good running back for a Georgia Tech there, a change of positions last year. What about you, Jeff? What's, uh, what's the Jeff Cameron key to victory? I agree with Corey on this uh, completely. Jamal Haynes was a really good running back last year, uh, ran for over 1,000 yards, was a stud right there in Georgia in Corey's backyard uh, in high school where he was a st- superstar. Uh, he's diminutive. You wouldn't look at him and think that he was a superstar in the making, but he gets lost behind that line at five foot eight. He's hard to find sometimes. Four State's got a couple guys like that where you literally cannot find him if you're a linebacker. The next thing you know, he squirts out and he's making a big play. He did a lot of that last year. He's a tough kid, too, for his size. But I think to Corey's point, if you're able to shut down the traditional running game, the one thing you got to be careful about on third down is we get back to Haynes King over and over again here. Uh, I would try to really contain him. I don't know that I'd pin my ears back here. I think I would say it's third and seven. I'm going to make you throw it because I like my corners and I know you can use your legs, so I'm not going to let you do that. You got to beat me consistently converting on third down, throwing the ball. This is a kid who a year ago forced the issue on third down a lot. That's why he had so many interceptions. Uh, Brent Key said that he has talked to him a lot about that in the offseason, that you got to live to fight another day. You don't always have to make a play. Let's see if he's been able to flip that mindset or not. I'd make him make those plays on third and five or longer. Keep him in the pocket. Make him throw it. Hmm. I don't sound like keys, plural to victory, but uh, <laughs> more content. I better. took liberty. I think we're ready to make our picks. But first, we got a whole gang of folks over at wordchant.com on our staff that want to let their voices be heard. Let's turn to them now for their game predictions between Florida State and Georgia Tech. Greetings from Ireland. I am outside City Hall in Cork. Going to make our way to Galway and then, of course, to Dublin, where in a few days, Florida State will be taking on Georgia Tech. Hey, in this game, I got my prediction. I do think it's going to be a little bit more of a struggle than I think will be comfortable with a lot of FSU fans. That being said, the Knowles will get the job done. I think that running game will be ready to roll. That offensive line has experienced a lot of good runners. And I do think, of all things, defenses travel. It's a long travel from Tallahassee to Dublin, but I think they'll get the job done. I think they'll be too much for Georgia Tech. Florida State will eke it out. Won't cover the spread. I like the Knowles. 27, Georgia Tech. 20. It's your guy Ira reporting from the cliffs of Moher uh, over here in Ireland. And uh, I like Florida. The view from here says the Florida State's going to win this football game. I'm going to go Florida State uh, 38, Georgia Tech 21. I think it's going to be a good game in the first half. I think the Knowles will win in the second half. Yeah, it's me. Who'd you think? Geno's, Howard Beach, New York. I've been traveling all day. Tallahassee to JFK got delayed, for which our friends at Air Lincoln gave me a coupon. Look at that, $10 off for a two hour delay. I decided to get out of the airport. Let's go have a slice of pizza, Tommy. That's what I did, so we're in Howard Beach. It's a beautiful thing. That's how the week begins. It's Sunday, full week of Dublin ahead of me, but when it ends, and it ends with triple zeros on the clock in the fourth quarter, we've got us some good news in the Air Lingus College Football Classic. Florida State wins by two scores, although it's lower the total than the experts think. 27-17 is your final score. I'm exhausted. That red wine was good. The Guinness will be better. So I'm through one half here in Dublin. I'm winning 70-14 to as Florida State over Georgia Tech. Uh, obviously, I don't think that's going to be the score in real life. Uh, I have Florida State winning this game 35-21. Uh, I think the key and the thing I'm most excited to watch is see how these linebackers do against that uh rushing attack that Georgia Tech has. Again, a really good rushing attack. I think that's going to be the key when it comes to this game is how well Florida State stops that run. Uh, but I, I'm pretty confident in the offense, pretty confident in the Florida State rushing game that Florida State's going to pull this one out. What's up, guys? Ben Spicer holding it down here in Tallahassee. Hey, I think this uh, is going to be a week zero game in every sense of the meaning. I think there's going to be some moments that maybe make you grab another Guinness out of the fridge or at the game or wherever you're watching at, and uh, maybe some surrender Cobras here and there. But all in all, I think Florida State finds a way to get it done. They come back here with the dub, 31-17 to Knowles. Thank you, gentlemen. Now it's our turn, everybody. Saturday, Dublin, Ireland, Aviva Stadium, the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. High noon back here on the East Coast in America on ESPN, Florida State taking on Georgia Tech. 11 and a half as we sit here and talk about this game, Jeff Cameron. 
Um, you can either tell us if they're going to cover or not, but uh, we like the score predictions. That'll tell us uh, enough that we need to know. There. So without further ado, Florida State, Georgia Tech opener. Can Florida State keep this uh, winning season openers thing streak going? I think they do, and I think it's a pretty close game into the second half, but I like Florida State to win it 34-20. to 20. Okay. Corey Clark, uh, how do you see this one playing out? I know you got I'm, a lot of confidence in Florida State. I'm right there with Jeff. I, I predict uh, like a 31 to 21 uh, type score, and I do Not think. We, yeah, we we think that uh, that that Georgia Tech will bring a lot of pressure because they have to. I'm really excited to see when that happens. Toa Feely and Jalen Lucas out in space, one on one with somebody that's trying to cover them, because Mike Norvell is very very good at the short little passing game action. And he's got some real weapons that can take advantage of a defense like that. So I'm predicting one huge play off a uh, a, pa- a a pass like that. Just throwing that out there. 31-21. Okay. I Corey's think- calling it for a touchdown on the screen. A little screen pass out there in the flats. I'm going to say Jalen Lucas, uh, some a touchdown in the neighborhood is 60 yards. Okay, I like it. I feel like that's the that's the, that would hit the under. I think the number that both of you guys have done right, Jeff. I'm I'm going to go the under on this. Um, I know this was a high octane offense. I was cranking out 30 points at will last year, but they obviously lost a lot of that production. Um, I just can't I can't imagine Florida State's defense allowing 20 points in in an opener. Even though I'm I'm worried that Haynes King might be uh, the next best thing or whatever. I'm going to go 24 17 Florida State wins. Well, that means all three of us took the under. That over under currently sits at 56 and a half. I came the closest to reaching that with my point total, but it, all three of us have this as an under. And that's because what? First games, guys, you know, could be sloppy, could be weird. And this is a different setting. They've never played over there, obviously, in the fields. It seems like to me, whenever teams go play football, whether it's the NFL or college, overseas, especially in Europe, they slip and slide all over the damn place. I don't know why the grass is so different over there but everybody's always slipping so I, I could see this being low scoring that's what you guys turn to here those those little margins that make up the difference between a winning bet and a losing bet so yeah. Yeah. use that as you will hopefully we'll see all of you out in Dublin understand if you can't make it go to the corner pocket bar and grill if you can't make it to the game the unofficial official watch pot uh, it watch opens at 10 a.m by the way on game day 10 a.m so there we go get after it there will be a pregame show on War Chant. Will it be on War Chant TV? It's sold out. Everybody wants to see Jeff and Tom before the game doing the pregame show. Will it at least be on War Chant TV for the folks back in the state? It's got to be, right? We're bringing the equipment, so I don't know why it wouldn't be. And I do want to say special guest Bjorn Warner joining me on stage. Uh, he's doing two interviews with me, one on the show that's just the pregame show, and then one as kind of a pregame hype thing on the stage before we walk into the stadium. Uh, so good to have Vaughn Stryker back in the fold. Yeah, nice. Yeah, absolutely. And there also will be a post-game show with Gene Williams and Tom Lang uh, 10 to 15 minutes after the game. So tune into that on War Chant TV. Subscribe to War Chant TV. That's our YouTube channel. It's totally free. Hit the bell. Get your notifications. And uh, Friday night, again, the old storehouse at Temple Bar. We will all be there on the screen, plus Ira, plus Gene, plus Tom Lang, plus Mrs. Clark, Stephanie mm-hmm. Clark. That's right. Um, will this be like this will be her first like royal visit um, since the marriage, right? Like during football season. This is your guys' f- football season as man and wife. Yes, yes, uh, exactly right. So the king and queen of war chant will be on hand in Ireland. So it, it's a they have royalty over there, right? So the king it, and queen of the, of the podcast, maybe. Not, <laughs> okay, not the actual sorry, world. my fault. Yeah. They're already over there. They've been there yes, for a few days. That's a good point. Very good point. All right, thanks so much for watching. Again, head over to Cummins Lifestyle on Instagram. Give them a follow. They're Knowles helping out some Knowles, talking to a bunch of Knowles. Uh, we certainly would appreciate it. Hit the thumbs up on the way out. For Jeff and Corey, I'm Aslan. Thanks for watching the first edition of the 2024 Workshop Report, powered by Cummins.